Hey everyone, good morning. I know it's Saturday, so really appreciate you all being here. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be. Um, uh, if you're here, that means you want to learn more about political technology hacking, and hopefully I get to answer some of the questions at the end of this session. Um, but before that, I want to ask something. How is the first ACI going on? Enjoying it? <laughs> so for, for me, it's the first time I'm at first ACI and first time at Singapore. I'm really enjoying it. So uh, I hope you're having a good time here as well. So let's get started. Uh, a quick introduction about me. Uh, my name is Yogesh and I'm from Nepal. I work as a cybersecurity analyst at TCS Cybersecurity Unit India and I spend a lot of time working on IoT and mobile application security. Uh, apart from that, I love to build and play with robots and break them very often. And today I'm here to talk about Bluetooth low energy exploitation and how to hack them. Uh, a quick overview of what I'm going to speak here today and what can you expect from this talk. I'll be talking about a very uh, basic overview of what exactly is Bluetooth and uh, what's the difference between the Bluetooth Classic as well as Bluetooth Low Energy. I'm going to talk about the BLE stack, uh, what exactly makes the BLE. Uh, after that, I'm going to speak about uh, what exactly, how exactly do you do the Bluetooth man the middle attack and how, to, how do you sniff uh, the tools and hardware used by sniffing the BLE packets. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about reverse engineering the mobile application for these fitness trackers. Uh, or may, uh, maybe if you have any other smart uh, applications like a Bluetooth lock or maybe anything, uh, talking about the reverse engineering of that. And at the end of the day, I'm going to talk about uh, how exactly uploading the firmware, firmware over these smart devices of uh, your fitness tracker works. Uh, so let's get started. First thing first, let's talk about Bluetooth. Uh, trust me, it has got nothing to do with the teeth. Uh, it's a wireless technology standard uh, for exchanging data of voice over the uh, short distance. Uh, Bluetooth is a short wireless communication protocol that allows devices such as your smart uh, phones, smart uh, headset, your uh, fitness tracker to transfer data and of voice wirelessly. It was developed somewhere in 1994 uh, at Ericsson. The standard was de developed by Ericsson uh, as a replacement for cable. It uses 2.4 gigahertz frequency and creates a 10 meter radius called Piconet. Uh, and it has a, like it has continuous data transmission. And you know, continuous data transmission means um, a lot of power uses, right? So a lot uh, for, for many years, these Bluetooth applications suffered a lame battery life, uh, battery life just because of continuous data, data transmission and uh, transmission and a lot of power uses. Uh, until a few year, years ago, Bluetooth 4.0 or Bluetooth Smart came into the scene. It's basically the power efficient version of Bluetooth that has made many amazing devices possible, like your fitness tracker, your coffee maker, your bulbs, your medical devices. Uh, there, is, there, there are a lot of devices out there. You name it, it's out there. Uh, this version of Bluetooth Smart is simply called Bluetooth Low Energy and designed to be power efficient uh, and low cost. And that's the reason why you can find these BLE devices for as low as 7 to $8. Dollars. Uh, but yes, BLE is an awesome technology. It enables us to connect to everyday things that we thought 10 years back would be crazy to do. Uh, like suppose uh, 10 years back, it would be, it would be crazy to think uh, your smart like connecting your shoes with a uh, mobile application, right? But thanks to BLE, right now smart shoes are out there in the wild. Uh, and if you see the application, it's out there everywhere. Your medical devices, your smart home appliances, it's everywhere. Uh, but before we move on, let me draw a clear uh, distinction between the Bluetooth, what we generally call Bluetooth Classic, uh, and the Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, your Bluetooth Classic is designed for a product that requires the continuous streaming of data. Like maybe your uh, headset, maybe your smart speaker that has to uh, do the continuous streaming of your music, uh, maybe anything. Uh, uh, it has higher power, because it has to have the continuous data transmission, it has to uh, has higher power consumption, right? On the other hand, we have Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, which is known as BLE, uh, maybe a Bluetooth Smart, a Bluetooth 4.0. Uh, this is great for products that do not require the continuous streaming of data and maybe just to send on or off to a smart bulb uh, or, or maybe sending your heart rate um, data to your uh, mobile application, right? Uh, the main advantage of BLE over the classic is that the ultra low power consumption. Uh, since it's designed to operate in the sleep mode and wake up only when the connection is initiated, right? Uh, like maybe only when uh, light is on or off, you want to send the stateful, right? So this is useful for those uh, applications. Not only the fitness tracker, but now many of your IoT uh, and smart uh, BLE just because it is sim easy to implement and low cost. But say that it's not perfect. Almo it has some flaws. Almost all the time, uh, it's discoverable. Hey, uh, it's like, hey, I'm here. Uh, you send me anything, and I'm going to spit out the information to you. Uh, and also, almost all the time, it works on the same frequency and sen same channel always. And uh, almost at any time, it allows any device to connect to it. And on top of that, uh, most of the hardware manufacturers do not take the benefit of link layer uh, encryption. Uh, but there are a few devices out there, like a smart watch, uh, which, uh, implements the link layer encryption, but at the end of the day, you uh, can sniff the packets, uh, but then it would be encrypted. You can decrypt it anyways. Um, but now let's go back to the fitness tracker that I talked earlier. I decided to focus on the fitness tracker because it's just that I saw many people using that, and I thought, why not hack it? Uh, and I decided to get myself a fitness tracker, but not to stay fit, but to hack it. Uh, but before we move on, we need to understand the few terminologies that, I'm gonna, uh, that you need to understand uh, in this BLE stack. 
Uh, if you see here carefully, there are two things out here, the generic attribute profile and the generic access profile. These are the two things that I am going to use it very often. So, let us see what exactly are these. Uh, let us first talk about generic attribute profile, a simple called GAT. A GAT defines the way these BLE devices communicate with each other with sub something called service and characteristic. Uh, remember this term service and characteristic, characteristics, I am going to use it very often. It makes use of uh, GAT protocol, which is called the ATT, uh, which in turn is used to store the service and characteristic. The most important thing to keep in mind is that GAT and connections, uh, the connections are exclusive. That means, BLE peripheral can be only connected to one device at a time. Uh, as soon as the peripheral connects to a uh, central device, it will stop advertising itself and saying that, hey, I am no longer available. It stops advertising itself. Uh, and other device will no longer be able to connect to it as long as the existing connection is broken. Uh, so, I think that is enough of theory and we can finally do some cool stuff. Let us first uh, see the very basic process uh, of uh, before doing the exploitation of BLE device. The very first step that you want to do is of course, getting more information about the device. For that, there is nothing much better than a hardware manufacturer's manual, right? Uh, and specification, you would want to read them always. There are few tools uh, that you do not want to miss. Uh, uh, that is BlueZ stack, uh, HCI tool and GAT tool. These are the tools that uh, anybody uses very often if you want to work on BLE. Uh, we'll look into these uh, tools in the coming slide. The next step would be to animate the service and characteristics, um, either by using the tools like HCI tool or maybe using your uh, mobile application. We're going to get more information uh, about the service. We're going to animate more information about the service and characteristics. Um, and the next step would be to reverse engineer the mobile application if they have any. A lot of information could be gathered by reverse engineering the mobile application. Uh, uh, many times, these smart device manufacturers uh, forget to harden the reverse engineering process. And many times you would find the entire logic how these smart applications, smart uh, devices connect to your mobile application. Like I was working a uh, couple of months back, back, I was working on a smart lock. Uh, I got it from China. So that smart lock, anything that you would need to uh, unlock that smart lock without uh, the password was there in the uh, uh, was there once you reverse engineer the mobile application. Uh, uh, I would be surprised if you didn't find anything useful out of that. Uh, at the end of this, uh, and the final step would be some, uh, doing some really cool stuff and hacking the smart lock and smart ball and a fitness tracker and uploading the firmware over the years. And at the end, yes, I'm going to talk about uploading the firmware over the year and how I was able to upload the firmware over the uh, fitness trackers. So, step number zero is selecting the target. This is the very first step that you want to do. You want to find out the Bluetooth low energy devices near you. For that, if you're in Kali or any version of Linux distribution, you can use HCA tool. Uh, you might have to install the BlueZ stack. Uh, BlueZ is as simple as uh, sudo apt-get install BlueZ. So, uh, once you install the BlueZ, these HCA tools, uh, HCA tool and GAT tool comes pre-installed with the BlueZ stack. Uh, and if you're on Android, you can use NRF Connect. Or if you're on iOS, you can use Light Blue or even uh, NRF Connect, right? Uh, you can right now go to the Play Store uh, or your App Store and download these two apps, uh, NRF, Connect and, uh, uh, NRF Connect and Light Blue. Uh, you can install these apps right now, uh, and then you can is scan the BLE devices, uh, all the smart devices near you. If a device is advertising, you must see there. Uh, and if you see, uh, using HCA tool, if you want to see how does that uh, works. Yeah, if I do HCA tool lay scan, I'm going to see all the devices that are near my vicinity, and uh, this is how we see all the devices nearby me, right? Uh, uh, as you can see. See all the fitness trackers that somebody is using. Am I band free? All these fitness trackers you're gonna show here. Now we know that device is advertising. Uh, we know it can be connected. The next step would be to listing down the service and characteristics. To do this, we need to connect our BLE device. Use the GAT tool if you wanna do it actively. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can use this NF Connect application. You can download it from the Play Store. And you can scan all the uh, nearby devices. You and then uh, so step number zero is selecting the target. Step number one is animating the service and characteristics. Uh, here we are trying to figure out what kind of service and characteristic the device is running. You can do this actively as well as passively. If you want to do it actively, then you can connect your device to your phone. Uh, and you can use apps like NRF Connect to do this. Once you are connected, it is going to tell you uh, what characteristic and service is running. Super easy. Uh, or maybe you can use tools like GAT tool on your Kali machine instead of, uh, installed with the BlueZ stack. Once you are connected, you can list down all the primary, service, uh, primary services and characteristics using primary and characteristic command. You must have UID and handle uh, for the service to perform any kind of read or write. Uh, like reading, uh, reading the sensor data and writing the sensor data. But if you want to do it passively, this can be done by sniffing someone's connection. At the very beginning, when these smart applications connect with the mobile application, um, they are like, hey, I have got these many services and characteristics, and uh, this is how I advertise myself. So, now anytime that you uh, want to scan all this stuff, you can go to the, you can go to here, and you can do the actual minus B, your MAC address of your uh, Bluetooth smart application and then after minus i is for interactive. So, once you do that, you would be, uh, yeah, once you do that, you would be able to list down all the primary and uh, characteristic services. So, at this point of time, you must be wondering, what could be this uh, service and characteristic? A profile actually does not exist in uh, BLE, but it is a collection of, predefined collection of service and characteristic. 
Service in turn is just a collection of characteristics. Uh, it provides a set of features uh, with associated beha behaviors to interact with the uh, peripheral. Like in the fitness tracker, uh, the device information could be something like, uh, you know, device uh, service, device uh, de service. Uh, and inside that characteristic could be something like, you know, uh, software revision number, hardware revision number, uh, and uh, could be anything. I think, I hope um, I made it clear for you. Uh, now, you might be wondering why in the planet I would be interested in talking about service and characteristics. Uh, it is because that's the lowest um, main entry point in the BLE device that you would be interacting with. Anytime you do any interaction has to go through uh, characteristics. Now, if I have to show you the same thing for my fitness tracker, uh, these are the few services that you could observe. If you see there, there isn't something called device information out there. If I expanded the device uh, information, I could see uh, my former number, former revision number, I could see the software revision number, and a lot more. To do this, I, I use this, uh, this screenshot is from Analog Connect. Uh, you can uh, download it right away from the Play Store, and you can have light blue in the Apple App Store. Uh, once you're connected, you might be wondering, hey, you guys, I'm connected to the BLE device, but I don't know how things work uh, down the packet level. Uh, is it possible to capture the packets of communication that is happening between a smartphone and a low energy device? The answer to that question is yes. Uh, if you're interested in learning how Bluetooth low energy works down the packet level, uh, Ubuntu is a perfect choice. Uh, Ubuntu is a really smart sniffer, and by the way, it's open source as well. So if you're wondering how to capture the packets down to the level, packet level, Ubuntu is a solution. And you could know how these your smart, application, smart applications and your mobile applications are communicating with each other. Um, and I prefer not to use any sniffers at all because sniffers do drop a lot of packets. And if you're somebody who, uh, like me who doesn't want to spend any money on sniffers, there's an alternative on uh, Android phones. So what I do is if there is an app available in the Android, uh, uh, I do install that. And then after that, I let it communicate with it. But before that, there is, uh, if you go to your uh, device about settings, you could find there is something called build number. If you tap the build number five times, you would enable the developer option. Uh, once you enable the developer option, uh, you could go to this uh, setting called enable Bluetooth SCI snoop log. Once you enable that, any uh, communication that is happening between, between your smart application and your mobile application would be logged there. And uh, you could transfer this uh, log file to your computer and you can open it up in YSR. It's super easy. Uh, now, since I have UIDs and characteristics, I got services. I was super excited to send a notification on my fitness tracker. I wanted to prank my friend saying that, hey, Trump is calling you, right? But to my bad, whatever I do, uh, the fitness tracker was getting disconnected in every 30 seconds. Uh, it was because I was missing out something really important that was authentication. Uh, now, not every devices would have authentication in, uh, for the BLE devices. Not every device that I have worked has authentication. Like the one uh, I talked earlier had, was a smart ball. The hardware manufacturer thought it would be super cool and super uh, interesting not to include the authentication. Uh, and they thought it would be super cool to uh, let your neighbor next door to turn on or off your light, right? So they didn't have any authentication. Then I happened to read the article by Andre, thanks to Andre, by the way, which is written very well uh, how this device's fitness tracker and smart uh, BLE applications do authenticate with the uh, mobile application. I'm not going to go in depth about uh, this, how this is working, uh, because I already have written, uh, I already have a working process here. You, can, you may feel free to take the pictures. Uh, if you want to go, uh, uh, if you want to know more about this, you can reverse engineer the mobile application for this fitness tracker, or maybe you can go to this link, medium.com slash uh, a dot the link you can go there. Uh, you could, uh, and then what I did was once I had authentication, I was connected. My uh, I connected my BLE application to BLE uh, fitness tracker to my uh, computer. And once I did that, I wanted to send send something a really cool notification. Uh, remember, I told you something about uh, NRF Connect, right? So this is a log uh, from the NRF Connect. So the beauty of this NRF Connect is that any communication that is happening, you could see what exactly the values are being sent, and you could always reverse engineer that and find out what exactly is happening. So you could start writing Python scripts to do uh, this authentication. Uh, there's a library called BluePy, which enables you to communicate your uh, Python applications with your smart uh, devices. Uh, uh, I don't care what application, uh, what uh, language that you use, but all you need to do is send your data to the uh, service and characteristics. That's what I, uh, we need to do. Using the NF connect, you can see the logs. It's basically used to see what is happening behind the scene. As you can see here, uh, the, uh, this particular values, when I send some particular notification, these particular values were being sent to the uh, uh, some characteristics. If you see the characteristic name, uh, the last four digits were 3, 4, FB. So to this particular characteristic, there were some values that were being sent. And when I started doing the reverse engineering, I found out something really cool. The first first two bytes uh, was the notification type. Uh, like uh, The 0, 01 is for email, 0, 03 is for call. If you wanted to send, uh, prank your friend saying that, hey, somebody is calling you, you could use these uh, uh, values to send them. And the next two bytes is the number of notification that you wanted to send. And the last few, uh, last hex bytes were the notification uh, types and no notification message that you were trying to send. You could send pretty much anything, uh, like a call notification, your smart notification, and whatnot. So this was a simple Python script that I wrote. Uh, 
many of you would be a Python fan here. Uh, so just go to the, my GitHub, github.com slash yoga, so that the whole tool is out there on how I was able to uh, hack these fitness trackers. If you see here the last uh, three lines, uh, I'm writing some value to that particular characteristics. If you remember a uh, long time back, I told you we're going to do any sort of communication that is uh, we're going to do to the smart devices is going to happen through these uh, particular characteristics, right? Uh, a lot of things you could do. You could even reshape the data and time. You could uh, send any SMS notification, a lot more. Uh, and if you see here, I was able to send any call notification to the smartwatch without uh, needing to toss it physically. This was uh, and just an example. And the next thing that I wanted to do was, uh, I saw many people using the fitness tracker, and I thought, why not uh, put this skull icon to the fitness trackers, right? Uh, since I saw many people using that, and I thought it would be super fun and super cool to do that. So uh, I started focusing on the firmware. So the next question was, where do I get the firmware, right? Um, as I told you, uh, so let's talk about the firmware first. So firmware is a piece of software that runs on an embedded CPU that's uh, written in either uh, C, that's written in C and is compiled uh, to run on the, your embedded devices and transferred either via a uh, programmer or you uh, using any wired tools. But the next question is, like, how do I get the firmware? Uh, one option could be reverse in engineering the mobile applications if they have any, or else you could capture this uh, DF, you could capture the uh, firmware during the DFU update. Uh, so, so what I did was, if you wanted to do the reverse engineering, uh, there is a tool in Kali or any version uh, of Linux distribution that you could uh, that you use, you could install this tool called APK tool, APK tool D, and then after that your cool smart application uh, APK. If you do, uh, you would be able to see all the like decompiled version of that APK, and you could see a lot of information out there. Uh, and you could see here, once I did the reverse engineering, I found out two important files here. That was our FW file and RES file. The reason why I was, uh, why I started doing the reverse engineering is, is because when I was disconnected to my fitness tracker and I do something uh, uh, wrong, the fitness tracker would update, uh, even though if I'm not connected to the internet, the fitness tracker was uploading uh, with the official application. So I thought maybe they should have something inside that. So once you go to the asset directory, uh, once you decompile the application, uh, there are a lot of folders, uh, one among them which you really want to look is asset directory. So asset directory is going to have all the formats, all the resources and all those stuff. So uh, I found these files and once you find these files, you can pretty much change almost anything. Uh, and once you make any changes to the firmware, uh, you have to hunt for the firmware up, uh, upload service. Uh, and I started uh, hunting for the form firmware upload service because I had to upload the firmware to some characteristics, right? If you remember, I had mentioned a powerful tool uh, called NF Connect that allows you to scan and uh, explore your low energy devices and even communicate with them. So I used NF Connect to look for the device uh, firmware upload service, DFU. Uh, many hardware manufacturers, they have DFU written there, but then uh, many times this is where uh, except, uh, sorry, expectation versus reality comes in. A lot of times it's, it's, it's going to be uh, all unknown services, unknown services, but at the end of the day, if, uh, like if, you, if you know how to use Google, and uh, Google is your best friend to do all sort of things, if you just uh, look for that particular uh, characteristics, if you just do the Google search, you could find what exactly is the DFU service. So there could be many services uh, with the unknown services, and it could be really difficult for you to find out. You can use Google for that, and then you can find out what exactly uh, characteristic is using uh, to do the DFU update, device firmware update. And the next thing is, how do I upload the firmware, right? Uh, when I reverse engineer the mobile application, I found that it is accepting the four bytes to initialize, initialize the firmware, uh, and update the five bytes for resources. Uh, so if you're gonna send uh, something on firmware, like suppose if you wanna change device name, your software revision number, or whatever, that's gonna be in the firmware. But if you wanted to change something, images, all those stuff, it's gonna be in the resource. Uh, it's, uh, it first sends zero one uh, as a first byte, uh, saying that, hey, I've got this uh, file with this particular file size. So uh, once you have this resource, you could append 02 at the uh, end to notify the update service saying that you are starting to send the resource and not the firmware. Uh, I have written the detailed uh, steps on how this firmware upload works, and I'm not going to spend much time on this. You may feel free to take the picture, and maybe you could go to medium.com slash yoga, so that I've written it over there. So I'm going to move into something really important. Now once you upload the firmware, your device could be waiting for checksum. Uh, this is really important. You need to know what exactly is checksum. Because when I was hacking this fitness tracker, I spent a lot of time uh, not knowing what exactly is checksum. What I did was I sent the firmware. Uh, it was until 99 percentage, and uh, after that I was just stuck. Uh, it was it was not accepting the firmware. It's because I was missing out something really important that was checksum. So let's see what exactly is checksum. Uh, checksum is a calculated value that is used to determine the integrity of the data during the transmission uh, uh, over the wireless, so that the man in the middle attack doesn't happen. Checksum. SOPS is a unique identifier for the data that is transmitted. If the data is changed, so does the checksum value as well. This makes it super easy to verify the integrity of the data. To test the data integrity, the sender uh, sends the sender uh, calculates the you know checksum for the data that is being sent, uh, and it does calculate the checksum as well. Now the sender send, sends the checksum as well as the data to uh, as well as the data to the receiver, saying that hey, this is the checksum I've got. Uh, is it the same thing with you as well? 
Now, if this checksum uh, value ma matches with a high degree of confidence, uh, the data is uh, reshape is proper and the uh, smart device is going to accept the firmware. If the checksum matches, then the firmware resource is accepted. Billy does not perform the uh, error correction, but it can only perform the error detection and Bluetooth 5.0 uh, introduces the error correction as well. Now, there are several types of checksums available in Bluetooth, uh, but Bluetooth particularly uses CRC, cyclic redundancy checks. In this fitness tracker that I worked with, it was using CRC 16 uh, uh, checksum. So, now if you see here, uh, uh, I was able to change, uh, this is just a proof of concept where I was able to change the device name as well as the soft revision number. Uh, if you see the device name, Jasper, Jasper is my dog by the way. So, I could uh, change my soft revision number, if you see the version number 9.9.9, .9 this morning I found out that when the version number is changed, uh, you no longer can pair your smart uh, fitness tracker with your uh, mobile application. Uh, because the, like suppose if right now it is running version 3.2.2 example I am saying and if the uh, soft revision number is 9.9.9, .9 the official mobile app is going gonna, uh, gonna to think that uh, maybe that particular application already has the latest version and, and I need not update that. So, uh, what is cool, what is more cool than, than that. So, I remember I told you about the skull icon right. Uh, again this is a proof of concept you could expect more than this. Uh, if you see the skull icon here, yeah, this is how I was able to output the skull icon. Uh, this whole source code is there in the GitHub. Firmware over the, uh, over the update uh, is really cool feature that's found nearly on all the embedded devices. I demonstrated on how this feature could be exploited to allow rem uh, attackers to inject malicious firmware modification into the devices. The problem is that hardware manufacturers do not cryptographically sign the firmware uh, in the system. Now include the uh, authentication feature in the device that could recognize if the firmware is signed by the vendor, uh, um, authenticated vendor. Uh, they literally accept the firmware from anyone. The solution for, for that for this could be cryptographically signing the firmware. If they implement this uh, security measures, again the cost of the device is going to be up high, but they have to sell a lot of device, right. So, many smart um, uh, device manufacturers like fitness tracker or maybe a Bluetooth lock do avoid this just to reduce down the cost. So, I am at the end of the talk, uh, does anybody has any questions for me?